Hey everybody, welcome back to Photorec.tv. I'm Toby and I've got your answers. This is a Q&A. You've sent in some fantastic questions. It's been forever since I've done one of these. I mean years and years. So I'm really excited to sit down and answer your fantastic questions. There's stuff in here for our everybody. Like when should you consider an f2.8 lens versus an f4 version of that same lens? What are the pros and cons? What do I think is the best mirrorless on the market right now for wildlife? We're gonna to get to that in just a second and a whole bunch more. So thanks for sending those questions in. I'm also gonna let you in on a few secrets on how I stay on top of all of this. Let's get going. This video is brought to you by Squarespace. I moved my own sites to Squarespace and I am so happy because they are as good as I say. <laughs> Go to photorec.tv slash Squarespace to start a free 14 day trial, no credit card required. And when you go to buy, you'll save 10% by using that link right down below this video. Thanks so much Squarespace and thank you for trying them out. It really does support this channel. Let's dive into that first great question. And I, I put a great one right up front. What do I think? What do I think is the best mirrorless camera for fast action wildlife photography? Now, this was sent in anonymously, so I can't give you any shout out, but this is a great question. And they add in why? Well, of course, I'm going to tell you why. I'm not just going to throw out a camera and leave you all to wonder why I picked that one. Although that'd be kind of a fun discussion in the uh, comments to let you decide. But my answer is the Sony A9 system. I say system because you've got the A9, you got the A9 Mark II. Honestly, as far as fast action wildlife photography, there isn't a whole lot of changes between those two cameras that make a difference. Most of the changes are a little bit in ergonomics and a little bit in connectivity, really, if we kind of boil it down. So either one of those cameras. The A9 is sitting there at the original at four grand, and the A9 Mark II is like, 45 grand or so. So it's not a cheap camera. But here's why I pick it. Blazing fast autofocus system, 20 frames per second, completely silently if you want. And the readout from the sensor is fast enough that you do not need to worry about any kind of rolling shutter or issues from that, even with the fastest birds and out to the wingtips, which is just fantastic. Um, you've got fantastic battery life and it's just a really good camera, but camera, remember, is only part of the system. You also need to talk about lenses, and Sony's got some good telephoto lenses. You've got the 100 to 400, which I happen to have sitting right here. Fantastic lens. Pair it with the teleconverters, you get great results. But you also have the 200 to 600, which is quite affordable as really good telephoto lenses go and get you all the way out to 600. I've got some friends here in the Seattle area that shoot with this to go up and shoot the, uh, the short-eared owls um, north of here and owls in flight, birds in flight, they nail it with this lens and the Sony A9 and also sometimes they're using the Sony A7R4 but I really think the A9 gives you for the fast action wildlife that's going to give you a little bit of edge. And then, of course, if you're really serious and you've got the deep pockets, the Sony 600mm f4 is an absolute fantastic lens. So that's my pick. But, man, the Canon R5 R6 system is really, really close behind. Um, not quite as good battery life. Uh, autofocus system, I hear from my friends that are really uh, serious wildlife photographers. Maybe it doesn't quite match up, but I'm telling you the difference is pretty small. Really the biggest issue right now with Canon is in the RF system, you really only have the RF 100 to 500. It's a great lens, but that's really your only lens for kind of telephoto wildlife work. We don't have any primes yet from Canon that are native for the RF system. You say, well, wait a sec, you do. You do have two primes, the 600 and the 800. These are interesting lenses. I think these are great values, but they're not lenses that very serious wildlife photographers are interested in because they are fixed at f11. 
So when you're shooting fast action wildlife, you need to keep that shutter speed up to freeze frame your subject. And if you're shooting in lower light, mornings, afternoons, evenings, um, doing that with an f11 lens is a little tricky. So I put that just a little step behind. Sony A9 system is quite good. But you know, the R5, as I said, is very similar. And, uh, and I really am excited for the new lenses coming from Canon that we'll see over this next year or so. Great question. Thanks for sending that in. We're going to move on to Robert D, who currently shoots with a Canon Rebel, but he has good EF lenses. He wants to upgrade to a full frame, but not mirrorless right now. Would the 6D Mark II be a good choice? I shoot mainly landscape hmm, and wildlife. Hmm. All right, Robert. Hi, how are you doing? Robert and many of the people who wrote in actually are frequent guests on our McKay Photography Academy trips. So I know Robert a little bit more beyond this question. And I'm going to say, yes. The 6D Mark II could be a good choice, but there might be some better ones. But let's talk for a second about the 6D Mark II. When it came out, I didn't give it the best review. Most of my issues were the fact that it used a slightly older sensor and its price point was higher than competitors using newer sensors. That was the bulk of my issue with the camera. But here's what I do love about it. Canon ergonomics, Canon build quality and reliability, a fully articulating touchscreen, which is just really, really nice. But it's not the fastest for focusing, and it only gives you six and a half frames per second. Now, actually, six and a half frames per second isn't bad. So it really depends on, you said landscape, you said wildlife. If you're primarily landscape with a little bit of wildlife, I'm still on board with the 6D Mark II. But if there is a bit more wildlife in that, and it's a little bit more of the action-oriented wildlife, birds in flight, or, you know, you're going to Africa and you want to possibly capture cheetahs running down a gazelle, then I'm not as excited about this camera. So what would be another option? Well, you could spring for a little bit more money and buy the 5D Mark IV. It does have a faster autofocus system. It does give you more frames per second, a half a frame per second. It is only seven frames per second, so maybe we shouldn't even count that. Um, and it is it's built even better, but you do lose that fully articulating touchscreen, which is really, really nice. These days, if, I mean, the Sonys only have the flip out, which is always a little depressing, but I tell you what, for setting up for landscapes, not feeling like you needed to be confined, especially, I'm getting a little older. My knees don't work as good. My back isn't always happy. And so when I'm feeling a little ouchy, I often find myself just kind of setting up at eye level because that's so where it's so easy to work with a camera if I don't have an articulating screen. But the articulating screen allows you to get the camera really low, and you can still stand up and just bend over and see what you're doing there. So an don't discount an articulating screen. They're very, very nice. So that's an issue. There is, I know you said you're not ready for mirrorless. You didn't say why, though. So let's just for a moment look at the R6. I was blown away by the progress Canon made from their original EOS R to the R6. I've got no complaints about this camera. Yes, it is only 20 megapixels. That's a little less exciting for landscape um, and, and a little less exciting for wildlife, truthfully. But, geez, it is a really, really nice camera. It's going to be able to use your lenses with a $99 adapter. They're going to work just as good as if they were on the 6D Mark II. And in some cases, they might even work a little bit better because the focusing system in the R6 is so good. And you have that fully articulating touchscreen back. You also have built-in image stabilization as well. Yes, it is $2,500. So it's a good bit more. If you really were looking for something and your, your budget says 6D Mark II, then yeah. 6D Mark II is fine. But think about the R6 just a little bit, Robert. Roger. Robert. Sorry. It's going to last for longer than I think. I think you might outgrow the 6D Mark II sooner than you would the R6. All right, let's move on. This is kind of a related question in some ways. We get to kind of come back and discuss this. Actually, it's related to the other ones. This is from Tom. 
And uh, you can check out his Instagram at Studio55J. I checked his Instagram out because it helps, it helped inform me to answer this question. He is torn between the Canon R5 and the Sony A7R4. He currently shoots with the 5D Mark IV. He's looking to get into mirrorless, mostly for the sake of that in-body image stabilization. Now, Tom runs a wedding business. Looks like you capture both photography and videography. So that speaks to reason, the reason why you're really looking for the IBIS. It makes handheld video shooting so much better and easier to work with. And it's also nice to use with prime lenses in a lot of cases so you can get that um, really steady shot with any lens that you have on the camera. Here's the thing, I'm gonna to lean towards the R5 for you, Tom, even though it's a little bit more money. And even though the video side of things is a little shakier, I, sorry, I shouldn't use that word, I worry about the overheating in the R5 if you're using it as a serious video camera for weddings. Sure, uh, 8K, unusable for any length of time. 4K is usable, for certain lengths of time. So depending on how you shoot these weddings, this could be a camera that works for you. Also, we've had one firmware update since release that has improved this. We have rumors of another one coming very soon that are gonna further improve the video features in the R5. So here's why I'm suggesting the R5 over the Sony, and I'm personally a Sony uh, photographer, and I think the AR, sorry, the A7R4 is a great Sony camera you're gonna be able to use all your lenses on the R5. That right there is saving you a huge amount of hassle. It's also going to feel very similar to what you're used to. You're basically gonna be able to go into a wedding days after buying this and not be freaked out because it's going to feel and act and work very similar to your 5D Mark IV. And the files are gonna look very similar so you won't have to do a lot of crazy post-processing, especially on the video side of things. So I lean towards the Canon R5 for you, Tom, at Studio 55J. Thanks for sending that question in. All right, we've got Nancy switching gears. Actually, I mean, so many of the questions are kind of dabbling around mirrorless. We are now fully in the mirrorless world, and I love it. We have great cameras from Nikon, from Canon, from Sony, from even Panasonic. It's, it's fantastic. Nancy's specifically asking about the Nikon Z6 II. Actually, not the camera. She's, she's already settled on that. Great. She wants to start investing in Z lenses. It says, there are three lenses that cover the 24 to 200 range. Do you recommend splurging on an F2.8 for one of these and which one, or will F4 lenses be okay? Thanks. Let's work backwards for that question first. So, uh, you know, I, I mentioned this in the opening. An F2.8 lens versus an F4 lens. Let's take, for instance, one of those lenses in the range a 24 to 70, very versatile lens. An f2.8 gives you more light gathering capabilities so that you can stay at the same shutter speed in lower light situations. You can also uh, control the background blur a little bit more or get, get a little bit more, or get a little shallower depth of field to really separate your subject from the background. Those are the things that you can do with an f2.8 lens versus an f4 lens. So it gives you a little bit more control in low light and a little bit more control over how shallow your depth of field is. The trade-off, a more expensive lens, a heavier and larger lens. I really see f2.8 lenses shining for people who are covering events and don't always have control over the light or can't wait for you know, the time to be right. They have to photograph this person at that spot wedding photographers often. I have shot with a 24 to 70 f2.8 for much of my wedding photography career uh, in the past, and um, it is a great and versatile lens. Also, what's nice about an f2.8 lens is if you want to do a little bit of astrophotography, f2.8 versus f4 can make a big difference in how easy it is to capture the stars. f4 lenses can still do it, but an f2.8 lens is much better at that, in my opinion. Um, I will say with modern cameras, it's becoming less of an issue. We have people that come on trips bringing along a 24 to 70 F4 um, and are able to capture the stars, but you're going to be at a higher ISO. 
So you guys got to keep that in mind. So, Nancy, I know you to mostly be kind of a all-around photographer, travel photographer. I don't really see you needing the f2.8 version because look at this. Let's let's take a look real quick. Here's the 24 to 70 f4 Z mount lens, thousand bucks. They got some used ones for 650. Shoo, that it's a decent lens for that price. If we go over here and look at that's the f4 too. If we go and look at the 24 to 70 f2.8 Z, bets on how much it is, double the price. $2,300. And it's a bit bigger and heavier. Now, I told you I was going to let you in on a little secret. I don't know if this is secrets or not. I love DP Review. I cannot keep in my mind all of the numbers about all of these lenses all of the time. And if you go to DP Review's homepage, they have a lenses section and a side-by-side -side lens comparison. And I think I already have one sitting right here. Yes. Here is the 24-70 f2.8 sitting next to the 24-70 f4. We can see those price differences there. And we can scroll down and see that the weight is 1.77 pounds or 805 grams versus 1.10 pounds or 500 grams. That's a pretty significant difference. We can also see that um, it's a half inch longer and ooh, an inch and a half, um, oh no, sorry, that's an inch and a half longer and a little bit more half an inch in diameter. So it is noticeably bigger and it is gonna be noticeably heavier in your hand, plus that price difference. So I think for general walk around photography, I think an F4 is going to be the better lens for you. Now, Nancy, you actually said three lenses from 24 to 200, I'm, I only think you need two, 24 to 70 and a 70 to 200. Now, right now, Nikon does not have an F4 70 to 200 for the Z mount. They have the F2.8 and that's another lens that people are raving about. When I say another lens, um, sorry, the 24 to 70 F2.8, people are raving about. Really, really happy with these lenses. In general, again, the mirrorless lenses from most of these uh, Canon, Nikon, and Sony. They're, they're really good lenses most of the time. So the 70 to 200, that is a $2,600 lens, and I really don't see you needing that, Nancy. Rumor is we'll get an F4 from Nikon sometime soon. It was, it was rumored towards the end of 2020, the beginning of 2021, so it really might be any day now that we get an F4 lens. So you said, but you know, if you're paying attention, and Nancy, you've been on trips, you like to capture the stars from time to time as well, and you think, well, if I get that F4, is that cut stars out? Well, another option you could do is the 20 millimeter F1.8 Z mount. So you add that in, and yes, it's a grand for a lens that is a prime lens and pretty specific, but it's fast. This is a nice focal length for stars. Some people, including me, used to like a little bit wider of a focal length, but I think 20 is really nice for stars. 1.8 is fast, thousand bucks. And here's the deal. You walk around with that 24 to 70 F4 during the day, la di da di da you're happy, your back is happy, your shoulder is happy. And then you're like, tonight I'm gonna go out and shoot the stars. Then you bring this lens along with you. So that's how I would approach that. I haven't said this yet, but folks, please, if you're watching this and you have some other suggestions, maybe there's a lens that I haven't mentioned or some other way to kind of you know, wrap your head around what lenses you should get for the Z6 II, feel free to leave those in the comments. I'd appreciate that. And the people who ask the questions would appreciate a second opinion, I'm sure. All right, I'm gonna take a quick break to remind you, this video is brought to you by Squarespace. I personally moved to Squarespace a few years ago for photorec.tv and my own personal photography portfolio. I am so happy with this decision. Their automated tools made it really easy to move my WordPress site to Squarespace. And now that I'm on this platform, it looks beautiful. It's so easy to add content to and it's secure. Many of you watching this are photographers. Squarespace provides photographers beautiful portfolios and gallery pages, 
All you need to do is pick a template and drag and drop. It really is that easy. But if for any reason you get stuck, they provide 24-7 customer support. If you want to sell your work, the integrated e-commerce system is incredibly simple to set up. They also offer an online booking system, email campaign tools, and analytics, so you can track who's looking at your site. It truly is a fantastic all-in-one platform. You can try Squarespace for free for 14 days, no credit card required. Start at squarespace.com slash photorectv to save 10% off your first purchase. Thanks, Squarespace. All right, we're moving on. Brad Stoops, who is brad.stoops on Instagram, says his Canon 18-135 to 135 kit lens on his 70D seems to miss focus more than it should. Do I recommend testing the focus on lenses to see if micro adjustments are needed? If so, can you explain the best way to do that on the cheap? All right, Brad. I don't know how long you've been following me, Brad. And, and for many people watching this, I've been doing this for a while now. I bought the 70D when it came out, and not too long after I had it, I noticed that it did seem to misfocus more often than it should. And when I started to explore this carefully, I realized that my camera had an issue. And I talked a little bit about it online. And very quickly, I found a good number of other people who are 70D owners saying a similar thing. Now, this is, it's always dangerous, because it's very easy for us to misfocus sometimes or to have some other variables kind of mucking up the work, making us think we missed focus, but really it was X, Y, or Z factor. And, but it was enough that it seemed like a serious thing. And I knew on my camera, I could document it. Here's the thing, on a DSLR, you've got two different focusing systems. You've got on sensor, and then you've got a little focusing brain. The focusing brain is used when you use the optical viewfinder. The image comes through, bounces off the mirror, and hits that brain, and the brain says, this is how much we need to move the lens to make it in focus. If you're using the sensor, live view, in the DSLR, the image comes straight through the lens, right onto the sensor, where the focusing system is, along with the image capture thing. So, whatever it says for focus is perfect for the image capture, so you're not going to get an out-of-focus issue there. But the mirror to the brain could be off. So that's where this microfocus adjustment system comes in. It allows you to say, hey, my mirror to focus brain is a little different than the distance to the sensor. Here's how to adjust it. And all DSLRs, all kind of prosumer level, it, it, usually the Rebels don't offer this or the, the bottom models from Nikon, like the 3500 and 3600. But up above that, you have a built-in microfocus adjuster that allows you to move and account for misalignment there. But the problem with the 70D that I had was that it was not consistently out of alignment. It would miss this way or that way or that way. And I sent it into Canon. They said, oh, you're right. Something's wrong. We fixed it. Here it is back. Nope, it was still wrong. Sent it in again. Then they said, oh, you're right. Here it is. We fixed it. Send it back. And it was better. It still never was great. And part of this issue, too, is the 18-135 to 135 kit lens. The kit lenses are decent, but they're not great. So sometimes the lens itself is a little wonky. So, Brad, you very may well have an issue. And I, yeah, well, you, you might. So what's a quick way to determine? Well, here's what you can do. Get a ruler or even a piece of newspaper. And set, your, set that down on a flat ground, well-lit room. Put your camera on a tripod a couple feet away, angled down at one specific line on the ruler or in the newspaper. Start at a middle focal length, 50-ish is a good range. The widest aperture you can shoot at that focal range, so you know you have a variable aperture lens as you zoom, the aperture stops down. I think you're gonna be at like five or five, six at 50 millimeters. And autofocus right on that line of text on the ruler or the newspaper and take a picture, then defocus the lens. You might have to switch to manual focus, defocus it, switch it back, autofocus. Do that 10 times in a row and see, did it land in the same spot every time? Did it land just off a little bit each time or is it all over the place? If it landed consistently off, then you can micro focus adjustment to line it up right. If it's all over the place, 
you might have the classic 70D issue, which Canon never acknowledged publicly to my, uh, to my knowledge, uh, which is disappointing because I do believe it was more widespread. But you had to pixel peep to see it. And again, it was so easy to just kind of think, oh, I missed that picture or that picture. Now, interestingly, Brad, another thing you could do just kind of for funsies is turn live view on, focus on that same spot, and do the same kind of process of defocusing, refocusing, defocusing, refocusing, taking a picture each time. And you should find that it is 100% accurate every single time through live view because of the way that system works. So that's the how to do it on cheap. But I just want to throw out there, if, if you spend a lot of money on a camera system and lenses and you feel like they're a little off, Rikan, who makes Focal, is a fantastic investment. They have these software bundles. The pro version is $100, and, um, or you buy it with a little target indicators too. And for many cameras, it's completely automated. You hook your camera up to your computer, point it at this target, and it does everything I just described, plus either suggests to you the micro focus adjustment setting you need so you exactly know, or it actually will change it for you in camera. So that's something cool that you should check out. So I hope um, you find that it's just off a little bit, Brad, and uh, you can fix it that way. Thanks for sending that question in. We're going to move on. Jody R. has a question. She lets us all know that she is a sunrise sunset nut. She loves the hues, the textures, but she's not sure about settings. She's always shooting manual. She's wondering, would a filter help? Mostly I'm asking about when the sun is directly involved. That's not before it comes up. That is not before it comes up or when it's dipped below the horizon. So she's asking, and she says this a little bit later, basically how to get a crisp sunburst. So how to get a nice sunrise or sunset where you can still see the sun and it's a sunburst. I'll show you an example in just a second. She says she's shooting with a Sony a7 III a 24 to 240 lens, it's the only one she has. Um, and she's wondering, is a tripod necessary? The pictures are always a little blurry, even with a tripod. And she says, I do know the settings need to be on a high aperture for this starburst or sunburst to work. All right, let's make sure we're all on the same page. Let's pop over to Lightroom here. And I have pulled up this image. Let's look at what it looked like straight out of camera. This is one example of what Jody is talking about. This is the setting sun shot at a slightly higher aperture, f13 in this case. So we're starting to get the little rays of the sun. Uh, this isn't quite as clean as I would like. I don't remember what lens I was shooting it with. Let's look at another example that is a little bit cleaner. Here we can see some really nice rays. We've got some other reflection stuff going on there as well. Then I got a shot in uh, Death Valley. All of these f13, f16, f18, and different lenses will give different starbursts. I actually um, am reviewing right now this new lens from Nissi. It's a wide angle lens. And it's kind of claim to fame is that it actually will start, or well, this lens starts at f4 aperture. It will start uh, showing sunburst at f4. And I did test it the other day. And it really does. Kind of neat. Usually, though, you need to be up f12, f13, f16. And the shape and the number of your um, aperture blades determines how many starbursts you get and how clean it is. I was going through looking for a few examples of this, and I saw this one. Um, and I was like, gosh, did I shoot this? No, this actually is my daughter's picture from the Grand Canyon last year. This, I believe, was shot with a Canon 10-18 to lens. Talk about messy. Look at this flare going on over here. But the actual blade, the, the rays are kind of cool. But gosh, there's a lot of other stuff going on. So let's come back to this shot, though, because I think this is closest to what Jody wants. And let's talk about it a little bit. Um, let's ignore that when you shoot at really high apertures, that is when you see all the dust spots that are either on your sensor or on your lens, which you can see here. So we're just going to nothing, nothing. All right, Jody. So let's again, let's make sure, let's, let's do some quick basics here. To know whether or not you need a tripod, you got to be looking at your focal length and decide how that affects your shutter speed. The general rule of thumb to be able to hand hold a picture without blurring it when you press the shutter button is it's two times your focal length. That's your shutter speed. So if I've got an 85 millimeter lens and I'm shooting, 
my shutter speed to be handheld should be at least, what, one, 170th of a second, 170. Uh, most cameras don't allow that shutter speed, so like 180 would be good. Now, yes, you've got uh, a lot of cameras with in-body image stabilization, some cameras or lenses with stabilization. It'll allow you to cheat that rule a little bit, but it, it's a good rule of thumb that when you must nail a sharp shot, that you are at least at that shutter speed. That doesn't account for moving subjects because we're not talking about that here. So that's the first thing you got to check in on, Jody. The next thing you got to think about is where are you focusing? Are you choosing your focus point and are you putting it someplace that makes the camera easy to focus? This is, in some ways, a low contrast scene if you're letting the camera kind of pick a focus point down here or even up in the sky. There's just nothing to latch onto for the camera. So it's going to try to focus and then maybe it's going to latch onto something you don't want. And then your subject that you want to be in focus isn't going to be. So it's going to be a little soft. So I really would put your focus point, move it so that it's right here on this um, high contrast zone between the bright sky and the dark mountain. If you put it on there, that should allow the camera to competently say, hey, I know what I'm doing here, and I'm gonna nail focus right on the spot you want. So that's how I would suggest going about that. Now, I will say, and this is coming from a person who just bought a minivan. How is that relative, you say? Well, I'm about to badmouth minivans and convenient lenses. See, minivans are really convenient vehicles. You can pile a lot of stuff in them. You can go to point A to point B on road trips, keeping the kids entertained in the back. But you know what? On your way there, your car doesn't look very sexy. It's not getting great gas mileage. And, you know, it's not sporty or off-road. It really is just kind of a convenient car. And that's the same with your lens, your 24 to 240 lens. It is not the sexiest, not the fastest, it's not the best at autofocusing. It's not a bad lens. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying you've sacrificed some of those qualities for convenience, for being able to walk around with just one lens. Now, Jody, I know you asked another question. We will get to that in a future video. Um, uh, but we're going to stick on this for a second. So some of the softness could just be the lens in general. But I have to ask you, how do your regular daytime pictures look? Are you happy with those? Are those crisp? Then, then it's not the lens, and I shouldn't have spent all that time bad-mouthing it. Sorry. Now, settings-wise, you asked. Oftentimes, I'm underexposing because I really want to protect the bright areas. If I, if I shot this as the camera suggested, it would be um, somewhere up in this. Oh, this is the local area adjustment. It'd be somewhere up in this realm. And... Because the camera kind of wants to get that foreground a little brighter. It doesn't like to see a big black area in the image usually. So I know as I'm setting up for this scene, I know the camera's exposure point is not where I want to be. I want to be underexposed a little bit. And then once I get it into Lightroom, then I can start to bring up the exposure a little bit, but more importantly, bring up the shadows. And that will allow that foreground dark area or landscape dark area to have some detail and interesting uh, bits without ruining the color in the sky. Hope that helped Jody and as I said I will get to that second question soon and Brad you had a second question too. I'm trying to split this up because there was a lot of fantastic questions and I want to uh, make sure we're answering as many as possible. We've got John R who is at MindWarm on Instagram asking me if I had to choose a prime lens, what would be the best focal length for street photography for both still photos and video? Any combination of specific cameras and lenses that you think would be really good at this? All right, mind warm. I took a look at your Instagram, which helps me kind of inform my answers, as I said with uh, Tom Jay's question earlier. I don't see any street photography on there, which says to me, and not, maybe I'm making assumptions that are wrong, but this is what I had to go on, that you are new to this. And folks that are new to street photography are usually not very comfortable in going right up to somebody and getting in close. So that to me rules out your kind of wider focal lengths. But maybe we should start and say, 
I think street photography can be done with everything from 24 to 200. And I mean, technically you could even go longer. I wouldn't go much wider. Everybody's gonna turn teeny tiny and anybody that's out at the edge of a frame with wider than 24 is gonna start to lean and look funny and distorted. So 24 to 200, that's a huge range. 35 is a very, very popular range if you're comfortable getting up a little bit closer to people. Um, I mean, gosh, there are so many different 35 focal lengths. 35 is also a fantastic length for video. But because I am making this assumption about you that you might want to be able to stay back a little bit more, maybe be a little more surreptitious about your capturing, um, you know, fly on the wall kind of style, then I think something closer to an 85 would be nice. I've got the Sony 85-18 on my Sony A7R 3 and I have to say, I really like this combination. You could go longer, but because you also said you want video, then it becomes a really difficult handheld situation for video longer without shaking, even with stabilization. You could be on a monopod or a tripod, but then that's really not street photography. That's kind of setting up and documenting what's happening in front of you. So I think 85, you could maybe go a little bit less. Um, Sigma just released their cool, is it a 60 or 65? I can't remember, an F2, so that's an option as well. But I mean, especially in the Sony, I just love this combination is so small, so lightweight, can almost fit in a big jacket pocket um, or a very small bag. And it leaves you, lets you be kind of quick to go, um, quick to pull it out and capture when you see something interesting. So 56, 65, 85 would be the focal lengths that I think you should look at, um, John, for that. All right, I think that's a great length for this. I'm not exactly sure how long this is be, but that's enough talking, my throat can tell. I will be back with more of your questions very soon. You send in fantastic ones. If you didn't send in images, images, questions, you can go to the link right down below this video to add them so that I'll get them in a future video. And a reminder, that this video was sponsored by Squarespace. It's just a really easy way to thank me for answering your question. Go check them out. Try playing with using their 14-day free trial, squarespace.com slash TV. And of course, as I said, if you have suggestions for any of these people that asked, please put in the comments right down below. I'll be back soon with the rest of the answers. Thanks so much for watching. Bye-bye. So I've had some reader questions over the last couple of weeks that I thought would be nice to answer in a video. Uh, one person has a question, then many more probably do as well. And let's get right into the first question. So the first question is, why do raw photos look a little dull out of...